my name is Lauren and I use she, her pronouns. I'm a member of the conference planning committee um, and I will be acting as a moderator for this session. So I would just first like to start with a land acknowledgement. We at the Benyon Center acknowledge that the land on which we operate and which is named for the Ute tribe is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshu, and Ute tribes. We recognize and respect the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government. And we affirm the, U the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. Additionally, I would like to go over some community agreements um, before I introduce our speaker. So, Speak in I statements, engage and contribute fully and genuinely, be purposeful and to the point, be conscious of sharing airtime with other participants, lead with compassion and respect, and create an inclusive environment where everyone can thrive. As a quick reminder, this session will be recorded and uploaded to benioncenter.org conference. If you are under the age of 18, please turn your camera off and provide only your first name. Otherwise, feel free to have your camera turned on or off during the rest of the session. So today we're joined by Devin Cantwell, she, her, hers, and she is a co-founder of the activist group Unsafe U, which has been working to raise awareness of campus safety issues at the University of Utah. She completed her BGS in political science with minors in WGSS and international studies at the University of Kansas in 2012 her MSc in political science at the U in 2021, and is currently a PhD student at the University of Ottawa in political, in political studies. Prior to graduate school, Devin worked as a K through 12 mathematics and computer science instructor for schools in Alabama and Mississippi. She has also worked as an instructional coach and content designer for Teach for America. Additionally, she has practiced, has practical experience in working for public agencies as a researcher and data anal analyst. She is a 2021-2022 Fulbright Research Fellow to Vietnam and will be based in Saigon with the Southern Institute for Social Sciences, studying city climate change mitigation and adaptation in Vietnam. I will now turn the time over to Devin. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for being here this morning. Um, <laughs> I also want to note, uh, we had a last minute addition to the panel as well. This is Rebecca. Um, I'm going to let Rebecca introduce themselves. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca Rebecca, she and they pronouns. Um, I am a current PhD student in uh, applied math at the U. Um, and I also did my undergraduate, my bachelor's of science in applied math as well at the U. So been here a long time um, and just grateful to be here. So yeah. Um, and I'm really happy to have Rebecca here today because a lot of the themes that we're going to talk about um, during the presentation discussion, um, I think it'll be like a really good discourse because we can talk about um, how, we'll, we'll, you'll see when we get to those points, but um, so the topic for today is community, or sorry, coalition building and policy engaged activism. Um, and I'll say for myself, um, so having time between undergraduate and grad school and doing community-based activism and organizing um, has really influenced my um, thought process behind what this looks like to do um, organizing and activism at a university level in a more institutional type of setting um, where you have like one particular institution that you're doing a lot of lobbying and activism around. Um, and um, Rebecca, um, although she's been at the U the whole time and like has gone straight through, um, do you want to like talk about some of what has kind of influenced your? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think just well, I think partially being at the U for so long, um, I felt like invested in you know giving back to the student body in some way. Um, during my undergrad, I was really focused on my degree, and then as I was transitioning to the a grad student role, I started to become a little bit more um, aware. Um, and not inherently because I was a grad student. Um, I think just like things become a little bit more apparent um, about like issues and how you have power as a student um, to tackle those um, issues firsthand. So um, yeah, being able to have that long-term perspective was really helpful um, for me. Um, and I, I wish I would have started a little bit earlier and been a little bit more engaged earlier, but I think, yeah, having that and being able to connect with more students um, was, was really helpful. 
Yeah, so I figured that was a good place to start today so that um, folks have an understanding of the mindset and the frame that we came into um, creating Unsafe You with, um, and also what kind of influences some of these tips that we're going to talk about in the presentation. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is just like read, read, read. Um, and I say this because we probably spend, um, I mean, so we have a couple of group chats that we use for organizing <laughs> across a few different mediums, but um, one of the things that we do is like we all we we check multiple social media accounts. We are like constantly keeping like updates. Like I have Google alerts on some topics um, that I know are related to campus safety or like University of Utah, um, especially when we're in the midst of um, organizing that was around the Laura McCleskey lawsuit. Like I have Google alerts for that, so I would know. Um, and what was really helpful about keeping up and on top of the reading for stuff was um being aware of like what is happening in the universe of where we are doing activism work in um because ultimately any type of activism you're doing like your organization or your group of folks is not the only folks that are engaging that space and you have to understand what's happening in the ecosystem around you um and so anyone like this is always like one of my first tips is like you need to like just like immerse yourself in reading and like going down a rabbit hole on these topics mm -hmm. Um, Rebecca, do you have anything you want to add on that? Yeah, just on that note, being able to like really keep up with not just like the news articles, but also like official statements or like documents that are like coming out about the like issue that you're concerned with is incredibly important because on one hand, like you're getting like the public facing statements or, you know, what's been like edited down into a news article. Um, but to be able to have that sort of like informed and powerful voice it's really critical that you like understand the language that's being used on on like the official level, like whatever that looks like. So um, and being able to have that language, I think, especially as a student activist, and this sounds like kind of unfortunate, but you're taken way more seriously when you're like, I understand the policy or I understand um, whatever, um, however this process works. So you have to listen to me. Yeah. And on that note, too, I think, you know, there's been we have probably had at least half a dozen instances where um, we have shown up to a meeting with administrators or other folks that hold decision making power um, and um, they'll like they're prepared to basically talk about something that was like, you know, a news release from the university like that week or whatever. And we're like, oh, yes, we've already read it. And here's our like annotations <laughs> about your policy or like questions that we have about this. Um, because ultimately, um, I mean, I know the phrase is cliche, but knowledge really is power when it comes to the activism space. And so um, uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit more um, in the other tips as well, but um, I can't overemphasize how important it is to be like well read on the topic um, and like I use reading in a loose term too, right like these could also include like listening to you know podcasts or like watching news clip videos or um you know seeing tiktoks about different topics um and that's one of the things we're going to talk about actually some of the coalition building we've done has been from like things that have popped up on tiktok and then finding out and like reaching out to their instagram accounts yeah. um so really just keeping an eye out for your like related issues and like i said google alerts is a really good resource for this and also following just different hashtags um but um, the second tip that we have on here is seeking out subject matter experts so i included a little screenshot of um like one that we we really leaned pretty heavily on a particular policy expert for this one. Um, so ultimately, I mean, you heard our backgrounds like I, you know, Rebecca does like math. <laughs> um, I do like environmental science, political science research. Um, we both have experience in a lot of campus safety issues, but we're not subject matter experts on everything. Right. Um, and so there's been multiple times where either the university has rolled out a policy or there's been a related policy. Um, and what we've done as part of our coalition building process is actually building out a really wide network of subject matter experts who share the same like values um, and concerns about stuff. So um, the picture that's on the screen here is about the body worn camera policy that the U has implemented. Um, and we put out um, a statement with concerns because um, this policy is probably going to undergo revisions um, because it's a like a I think it is like an in use policy right now, um, but it's they're going to continue to revise um, pieces of this. Um, but one of the you know things that's really important about this is like we're not map experts on body worn cameras, but we know that this has an impact um, both positive and negative for a lot of um, campus safety. Um, outcomes. We know that there's financial costs that go into this. And so um, we wanted to make sure that if we were going to like publish critiques about this um, or raise questions about this, 
um, that we really knew what we were talking about. So we reached out to somebody who's literally writing a dissertation on body worn cameras and their use um, and like sat down for just like a 45 minute conversation where we said, okay, I just have questions about this. Like, tell me more about this company. Where do they store the data? Um, so knowing who the subject matter experts are and being able to have like a cultivated relationship with them where you can call them up um, or text them and say, hey, we're looking at this particular type of policy. Do you have resources on this? We've also done this with, um, when we've done advocacy for Title IX policies, um, there was a window of opportunity when, um, it was during like the DeVos administration, they were making changes to Title IX. Um, and universities last August had the opportunity to, um, and were required to revise their Title IX policies. Um, and so we reached out to like Title IX subject matter experts to advocate for particular changes to the Title IX policy. Some of those things have gone into effect, they're pushed back on other pieces of this, but what was helpful is that um, like there were a couple of points um, where we were able to push the university on it because we had talked to the subject matter expert about universities say they can't do X, Y, Z. The reality is here are these, all these universities that do these things and being able to show up with examples of that. Um, are anything else that you would like to add on that piece? No, actually, I think you covered okay. that perfectly. Yeah. So this is also important too, because, um, uh, as especially like as undergraduates, um, if you're like kind of traditional aged, um, uh, not to say that you all don't have like lots of life experience with stuff, but um, you'd like, you know, even I'm in my 30s now. I'm 25. Um, yeah. Right. Um, and, you know, we know infinitely more than we do did like a decade ago. Right. Um, but even then we're not experts on everything. And, um, it, and it's really important that like, you're not getting basically blindsided by stuff because if the people who are making decisions on things and hold the power to make decisions are the only people that are providing you information, you are only getting their perspective on this and you're not actually getting the subject matter expertise on it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've actually learned through this process, um, especially on the technology end of this, is that oftentimes policies are put in place very hastily mm -hmm. without any input on subject matter policy, <laughs> um, subject matter on this. Yeah. So I don't know if anyone remembers Banjo from a year or two ago, which was a state contract. Um, and um, there was a piece that broke in the Salt Lake Tribune um, about some of the data privacy issues on this. Um, we immediately pushed back on some pieces. We talked with like multiple university administrators on the back end of this. Um, and the surveillance committee um, that does approvals on this has taken a much more active role after the Banjo situation and are acting as subject matter experts in this now. Um, and not to say that like we had direct correlation of any of those things because many of those things were in place, but what was helpful about this was um, we, because we were able to put pressure on the fact that like this policy was made without a subject matter expert in technology approving this contract and putting the policies in place, it led to bad outcomes that um, put people's privacy at risk and it put people in the risk of like facing white supremacy um, and like having white supremacists have, supremacists have access to data. Um, so tip three on this, um, power in numbers. Um, so we, um, one of the most challenging things I think has been actually trying to, to balance out like when and how we do the numbers piece of this. And I think there's like meta levels of yeah. the numbers piece of this, right? So um, I think most people are most familiar with unsafe use activism when we do like protests. And we actually haven't done like an in-person protest for about a year now, a year yeah. and a half. Not in a while. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I included a little screenshot of this because one of the things we have been doing is um, some, like, when we know that there is an ability to either, like, quickly rally people, um, we've now created, like, procedures and protocol that has made it easy for people um, to, like, quickly access the information that they need to advocate um, in support or against a particular policy, and then also give them the resources. So, for example, this email template, we actually, like, like helped educate folks about like, okay, how do I find the person that I contact? Like we get background on like why we are asking you to contact X, Y, Z people. Um, you know, mentioning here that like, you shouldn't be, this shouldn't be cookie cutter. Like these are places where you should personalize. Um, so also helping people build like long-term skills um, with civil society movement. Yeah. Um, so not just like, oh, we're gonna have you sign this petition for this particular issue, but let's actually build your like civic engagement capacity to understand the systems of power more at play. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about like some of the like numbers within the organization and like how we've kind of built out our horizontal structure? Yeah, yeah. So I think um, some something that has been like challenging, it, at least now at this point, um, with I think Unsafe U has um, 
a, a reputation behind it uh, of like um, doing a lot of research and and being very active um, on particular issues. And so um, one thing that's been really important in terms of our kind of, I guess, quote unquote, recruitment of, of kind of building out this network of folks is making it clear that we want if people really care about the issue of campus safety and we want them to be involved at the level that they can be, whether that's um, following us and sharing things and like continuing to be vocal on like their social medias and in their circles, um, whether that is like being part of like kind of the research crew and like digging into things and um, writing articles, writing um, op-eds, things like that. Um, um, or if that's showing up when we have an in-person action and being part of that team in some way. Um, and so just making it clear that like everybody has sort of a space. Um, and if we don't have one already, we probably can like build out some sort of like thing that they can do. Um, another thing that's been, I think, really important in this last year is sort of doing some um, and I think we're going to talk about this on another one of the tips, but like kind of building um, like allyships and partnerships with like other groups who um, have maybe access to a different set of the um, student population or like a set of the um, po general population that you need their support. Um, that's that's been incredibly um, important in like the top right corner um, that that protest, we had so much support from different community groups, um, not just in terms of like, like bodies showing up, but also um, making more students aware of the action and more students showing up and also like getting us a microphone and things like that. Um, and uh, that really boosted that action's um, impact, I think, in a positive way. Um, so being able to not only have just like that individual network of, of students within the organization, but people that you can reach out to and say, hey, we need support on this issue. Can you please put this on your social media, um, send this out to your email list, whatever that is. Um, and that actually was incredibly helpful, I think, too, with our SB 163 effort, um, just in terms of, you know, making some noise about it and getting um, the general public to kind of know what, what this bill was. Yeah. Um, that it didn't just affect the U, that it would affect, affect the whole state um, and kind of move um, the whole state forward in terms of care safety. Yeah. <clears throat> the other note um, on this too is that the power and numbers piece becomes particularly important. Uh, I think this is actually going to become one of the most important things in activism spaces in higher education. Mm -hmm. um, higher education institutions have become very adept at um, basically PRing their way out of issues. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so um, they're very good at basically figuring out, okay, who's the one or two like heads of the organization, like we'll meet with them, appease them. And we actually saw this happen because um, in, in parallel, there were a couple of other people that as we were getting off the ground, um, there was a reporter at the Crony, um, and then a couple of other people who were like kind of loudly protesting about what was happening with the U. <clears throat> um, and unfortunately, one of the things that happens when you don't have large numbers of stuff, or if you have like a very hierarchical leadership structure is that um, it's very easy for like in a PR driven, like institutional response for them to basically pick off the top heads of this um, and either boot through like, oh, okay, like we're going to appease them and basically like run out the clock on this until they leave. <laughs> um, or we're going to, um, you know, basically like make this seem like it's going to be continued like very difficult for these folks to continue to like, lead this organization um and one of the things that's helpful about the power and numbers with us is like there are multiple times when we were first getting off the ground where the administration was really trying to figure out like okay who's like leading this and like the reality is i mean we have um we've probably had about 50 people part of our network um and they all play very different roles on this like there's people who are part of like formal leadership structures or have been part of formal leadership structures that have contributed either like information or research or like have helped um, like per, like it really like it, it's I know it sounds cheesy but like we truly could not do it without like everyone pitching into this and we made the decision at the start that like because we knew this was you know there was a lawsuit involved with the university um, like this was something that um, you know, some heads were going to roll if it will, right? Yeah. Like, um, we knew that um, if we had like a higher article structure for this, like we were going to fail really fast on this. Um, and it was also going to put a significant amount of pressure on a couple people. So it's been helpful about having a more like 
um, horizontal leadership structure is that um, there isn't just like one or two people that they can like win over um, because we are a network of people. Um, and so we have a couple like public facing folks like Rebecca and I like talked about this very early of like, okay, like, you know, at the end of the day, like we feel pretty strongly about what we're doing. We feel also pretty strongly that like, we have like a lot of racial privilege. We have a lot of class privilege. We have um, like a lot of access to formal power structures as well in networks. Um, and so we felt pretty confident about like, we feel comfortable being the public facing end of this because if something happens, like ultimately, like we, we have enough like cushion and like safety net um, whereas other people involved in our organization, if something like that happened to them, like they would lose access to like their forms of income. Um, there's folks that probably would have lost their jobs if the university knew that they were involved with our network. Yes. Um, and like, there was like, yeah. Um, so, um, and that is like a reality and we can definitely talk about that during the Q and A piece of this, but the power and numbers piece becomes particularly important with that. Um, the more people that are involved, the harder it is to like pick people off and the more safety there is in numbers with that as well. Um, so I also want to talk to you about the fact that when you are doing activist work and organizing work, your word is your reputation. Um, I actually included here, so we did, um, a petition, um, right at the start of the school year, mm -hmm. um, when Pfizer was like fully authorized. Um, and, uh, the data that we had available to us at the time, um, was in like this, un like this, uh, like crossed out portion of this. Um, this was the data that we had known because the U hadn't come forth like publicly <laughs> with their information and data at the time um, or like the sourcing of their data. And so um, we published this, we got an email back from somebody in the president's office that was like, hey, we saw your petition, um, you know, just wanted to one, let you know that we received it, but also um, we just wanted to give you like a little correction about the information here. Um, so we really had like a, a I, this, hasn't happened to us a lot because we are very careful about what we publish. Um, but this is actually one of those things that like, it did fall through the radar. And like we, when we were corrected on it, we, you know, we could have said, okay, well, we're just whatever, you know, we're gonna ignore it. And, and to be fair, we also had a conversation where we're like, I don't know, this is like some hair splitting on a couple of things here, but um, it's like, you know, but we felt, you know, we need to, we need to publish a correction on this and we need to own that we made a mistake in the information and let people know, um, that like we didn't have access to the information, what that updated information is. Because part of us, like we see ourselves as an organization, partially the function is like to give information about campus safety, right? So if we're giving wrong information, like that is antithetical to our values as an organization. Yeah. Um, and then also decreases people's trust. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that I think has helped with the success of our organization is that people know that they can trust the information that we give them. Um, there have been times where people have asked us to like publish information, um, and we've, we have a lot of debates about it because it's like, okay, like we do believe that this is a thing that happened. And also if we publish this and this is wrong, like suddenly like one, it, I mean, it completely blows your effectiveness as an organization, but also people just, they're not going to think that this is a trusted place that they can get information from anymore. Mm. Um, and so, um, you know, we really want to emphasize that, um, you, there's a phrase when I started teaching um uh so I moved down to Alabama and they love like idioms and phrases and stuff but um I um when I moved down to Alabama right after undergrad the director of the organization that I was working with um first thing he said was you have two ears and you have one mouth and you should use them in proportion mm -hmm. um and I think this is like comes very well into play with like your word is reputation because um if you're just like writing with the first thing that you hear or you have an assumption about information because there's multiple times too where we thought that we knew something and then we've dug into a little bit we're like nope we were wrong like yeah. glad we didn't publish something on this mm -hmm. um but you know i i can't emphasize enough how important this is is there anything you want to add on that rebecca um yeah i think this also kind of uh gets into and, and maybe y'all have heard this like a, a bit i know that i when i started kind of getting into the activism realm um, I was given this word of advice many times over, <laughs> which is um, you don't always have to be moving fast um, and and that the change that you want requires like sustained movement. And so I, again, like what Devin was saying, like your word is your reput reputation, like in it, and it all comes back to this trust in, in your group, in your movement, in your cause um, and being able to take your time um, when applicable 
and really make sure that you have all the facts that you have everything that you need to move forward with something and that you aren't um, presenting incorrect information or misinformed information um, in, in a huge way. Um, that's that's incredibly <laughs> critical, especially especially with um, once you kind of get to a point where you have um, a foot in the door in a sense, um, not all the time, but yeah. often <laughs> or can wedge that foot in the door um, pretty easily with um, the sort of support that you have from the community. Um, and yeah, again, I think the biggest thing is that like your community around you is like and your support system um, behind the cause is your greatest asset and uh, to lose them in this way would be like catastrophic to your, to your issue. So, yeah. 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 And this is really related to this. And like our last big tip on here is like find intersecting groups and issues. So these are just like a couple of screenshots of ways that we've, um, either groups have reached out to us to ask us stuff or, um, uh, you know, um, issues that we've seen. So for example, um, I would, you know, we were on TikTok and we saw the shutdown Fiji um, stuff trending on TikTok, which for those that don't know, um, essentially there was a series of um, sexual assaults that happened um, with a fraternity. Um, There's like a pattern of it at University of Nebraska um, and this chapter is still at function. Um, there was like a particularly violent one at the start of school um, and um, they like the org, the organizers for this basically did like weeks of protests on like massive protests on end. Um, but um, you know, we saw it and I I we were able to kind of track down <laughs> through Instagram who um, you know, the shutdown Fiji account um and connected with them and we we're like, hey, we found out basically that they kind of like had stumbled into the activism on this. Like it went on TikTok and like took off, right? Um, like it, this was being covered like nationally, internationally. Um and um, the folks that we talked to were like, we actually feel a little over our head right now. Like we want to be able to like succinctly explain what's going on, but like, we've never done this type of stuff before. And so we actually volunteered to like create a slideshow for them explaining like, okay, here's what's going on with this. We published it on our page, sent them the slides as well. Um, and it was really helpful um, because then they were able to send like, like we had the resources and practice and experience with like succinctly explaining like a very complicated set of campus safety issues. We were able to like quickly offer that expertise and like produce content for them. Um, And um, as a result, like they were able to have, like it allowed them to get like a couple of ducks in their row um, to like get stuff organized. We also, um, I included like a flyer down there, Rebecca and I were on a panel last year with the library is about um, alternatives to calling the police. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been advocating for as an organization has been, you know, abolishing UPD. Um, and what does that look like, right? Like, what do we replace it with? And like, what are the implications of this? What does this mean for structures that have to be in place? Um, and we also um, did um, like advocacy um, and um, had people reach out in support of House Joint Resolution 13, which was declaring racism as a moral and public health crisis, because ultimately, when we think about folks that are least safe on our campus, it is, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color, it is queer folks, it is disabled folks. Um, and, like, ultimately, if we don't recognize these things as, like, public health crises um, and the systems of violence um, as as contributing to this, like, we don't get very far in our activism. So one of the pieces of this with finding intersection groups and and issues here is understanding, like, what are the systems of oppression and power that are causing the outcomes that you're organizing around, right? So like, in our case, we're talking about a downwind effect of campus safety, but really campus becomes unsafe because of systems of misogyny, racism, homophobia, xenophobia, like, those are the systems that actually produce that type of violence. And when we talk about campus safety, we talk about how do we minimize the violent effects of this for folks so that people do not have to worry about those while they're also in school trying to like get their education. Mm -hmm. Um, And so um, when we find issues that are going on either nationally, locally, um, you know, we like we will issue our support partially too because we know that we have a platform of like 3,700 people Mm -hmm. that we can easily get information out to. Um, And so finding those intersection groups and issues is really important, but it also, I mean, it goes into that last piece on this though, and this is why the information piece is so important, right? Um, So for example, when we were doing the shutdown Fiji slides, um, there was kind of some hearsay information about it. And I told the group, I was like, um, I was like, I, 
I believe that what you're saying on this is true. However, we're only going to put stuff that we can document and like trace back to a doc, like documented instances um, in these slides, because the last thing you want is somebody to get hung up on a technicality of something that like might have been like slightly interpreted differently, or like we didn't write it down because it's like a game of telephone. I was like, you know, both our reputation and your rep reputations at stake if we get a fact wrong on this, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so as you're finding intersecting groups and issues, that's why that like piece of integrity becomes so critical because if you lose integrity, you lose everything. Yeah. So, and I know you, like Rebecca's really taken on the like, get it, like finding all of these questions. I'm gonna hand it over to Rebecca <laughs> <laughs> to talk more about that. So like on, I guess, sort of like a, a philosophical, like sort of note, um, one of the things that I think is so critical um, being an activist is is finding how like and truly understanding like how your issue that you're advocating for fits into like the greater scheme of life um and um this is going to sound like incredibly cheesy and ridiculous but like i i have found that um in in doing activism in this way where you're you're focused on an issue um in particular we're focused on um, our campus at the U um, and making it a safer campus. Um, hopefully one day, like it would be like 100% safe, but um, <clears throat> like uh, we're focused on this issue, but um, but uh, like Devin was saying, like it's so interconnected um, into all of these other issues, not, not just the ones even on this side, like just like, and there's so many, so many more like women's rights um, queer rights, trans rights, like things like that, like all coming together and intersecting in this one space. Um, and being able to like really see from like a top down or a, like a bird's eye view, like, okay, here is like how my issue fits into all of this, um, gives you a good perspective as to like what fights like you should prioritize yep. and, um, and what like solutions will be like the most optimal and also like sort of benefit like the larger structure um it also like i think is a much more fulfilling way of like doing activism and rather than sort of like being in your bubble and you're like just going to steamroll over everything until you get this one thing and then, and then you look back at what you've done and it turns out like oh <laughs> this wasn't like the most the, the best way to do this and in yeah. fact like isn't a sustainable solution um and only benefits maybe like a small like number of people yep. Um, to make them safer, but like now everybody else is not yep. as safe as before or um, less safe. Um, and so, yeah, I guess what I'm trying to say is that like, like I think this type of activism, this like intersectional activism is much more like in touch with like our humanity and like, like caring for one another on like a real level. And so um, I think in on some way like you de definitely need to be careful and like making sure that you're not like overwhelming yourself and like kind of getting away from like your central um issue but as long as you're like staying true to like the mission of your group um i don't think that's an issue so yeah in like the cheesiest way possible i'm saying like this this will like make you a whole like person <laughs> by <laughs> engaging in activism this way yeah, and that's um that's everything we've got. So we will open the floor to discussions and questions. questions. Yeah. So. Sounds great. Thank you so much for sharing these awesome tips. Um, I can start with some questions that we have pre-prepared, and then if anyone else has any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat and I will field them to Devin and Rebecca. Um, so I'll start with the first question. How has Unsafe U managed to maintain momentum in their advocacy when campus safety is not as top of mind? Yeah, okay. I think the intersecting issues piece um, mm -hmm. is one of the, so um, when we talk about camp, like there's obviously like the very like, you know, okay, police on campus, uh, sexual assaults happening on campus, like especially when the Laura McCluskey lawsuit was going on, developments with that, like those are all like very front and center pieces. Um, but in kind of the downtime um, <laughs> between those, um, like a couple of the things that we do, so like legis, for example, like legislative action, we've got the upcoming legislative cycle mm -hmm. and we're um, collaborating with um, some legislators again on <laughs> some upcoming legislation. We might hold off until the 2023 legislative cycle um, on a couple of these. We're figuring it out next week. <laughs> um, so like, you know, community stakeholders, um, when we find other issues. So for example, 
you know, we could have stayed out of the whole like vaccine mandate piece of like debate of this, but, um, you know, we realized one that like, um, we had talked as an organization for a long time about, um, cause we actually thought about pushing for this before the final authorization. We decided like as an org, like let's hold off until <laughs> it's like the fully, like it's off of the emergency use authorization. So kind of also planning long-term about like, what are things that we think are going to be on the horizon and like, when's the strategic time to like launch those. So like we were able to launch our campaign, I think maybe like within the hour of yeah. the FDA announcing the, the full approval. Um, and it's because we, we had taken time to strategically think about how this fits into the larger picture of campus safety. Um, we also have even, um, so the like ASU elections, we like sent out really comprehensive long surveys <laughs> to groups um, and came up with this like very complex um, like scheme for like anonymously scoring them and like publishing scores and info cards on this. Um, and um, I think that, uh, so like thinking about that, cause we know, you know, okay, every year in like February, March or so there's gonna be elections. So like we, we have that kind of planned out. Um, so thinking, you know, in terms of a long game on this, like you have to think about, okay, is my activism, like Rebecca had said, like, is this like a, okay, are we being activists like for a one particular small thing, which is fine. That's also like great activism. And sometimes that's super necessary to have like a really targeted small, like activist push on this. But then also if you're like for our org, we realized after um, we started doing advocacy around the Laura McCluskey lawsuit, like this was not just about Laura McCluskey. Like there were things that were fundamentally broken about systems of safety in this campus. And so, um, and we also, you know, we're actually in um, uh, like this month we're submitting like a little proposal and going to start doing marketing and stuff for this, but um, we're actually going to be getting together national activists who are working on similar issues um, one to kind of get people like excited <laughs> at the use campus, but also um, because, you know, unfortunately these campus safety issues are not things that are just unique to the U. And yeah. so I think maintaining the, that has been like finding, like planning the long game on this, understanding where this falls into the larger systems of power and structure. And then, um, you know, also finding things that are like joyful. Like we, like we have a, you know, I mentioned we have a couple of chats, like, yes, we share serious stuff on there too, but we also share like, you know, uh, there's like a bunch of us that are like ADHD and are also water signs. So we can share a lot of like funny stuff too. Like there's also like, there has to be some joy in the activism or like, it's just trauma on trauma. Exactly. So yeah, that's really important. If I could just tag on to that yeah. last part, especially to like, um, I think, I think it's like, you don't have to be friends with everybody that like you work with in an activism space, especially if it's like quite large um like all like all of the people in our network I wouldn't say I'm like friends with everybody because there's so many folks that we could reach out to but like um but I definitely have like, a close-knit like group of friends within Unsafe You like that I can like talk about things other than like all of the trauma of the things that we advocate against um or like the intensity of things that we're advocating for as well um and on that note as well I would say it's really important to not always be reacting um, there are definitely times that you're going to be reacting because a new situation comes up and in our like line of work, I guess, <laughs> like, uh, like that um, is something that is pretty common um, when new things break out or there's like some new like scandal type thing that happens, um, which um, unfortunately is like fairly common at the U. Um, but and and like Devin was saying, like planning out that long game and having like a plan for what you want to do. Um, rather than like okay we're just gonna sit here and like once i get this google alert now like everything's like in action and that's yeah. all that you're doing because that's exhausting i've also joked too is like there's some weeks where like the you will have like three major events happening i was like man i had so much paper so yes. many <laughs> right this week like <laughs> i was like could y'all like please pause a week on this like <laughs> um but yeah no so i i think yeah i, I think that's a, those are really good add-ons to that so you kind of touched on finding joy and balance while also doing this work. Um, so what is your advice for students that want to engage in policy making and advocacy, but also have to balance things like being a student or having a job or both? Yeah, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that is a good question. Um, sometimes I don't know if I have like fully like figured <laughs> out how to do that. Um, I think I really think the biggest thing is to like, you have to be honest with yourself about how much you can take on, um, especially like, like not just um, in the moment, like 
like Devin saying like, oh, something big happens. Like how much am I able to contribute to like us responding or doing something about this? Um, but also like, okay, this semester, like this is my work schedule, this is my school schedule. This is like what I need, like the time that I need for that and the time that I need like for myself to like go do whatever I need to do to feel good. If that's like going on a hike, if that's like taking a nap like every day at a certain time or um, binge watching like Great British Bake Off or something, I don't know, like um, whatever people need to do to like do that like um, recovery um, within their own life. Um, and then like being real about how much time you have, because I think that there is a tendency to like overcommit yourself um, and, and put in so much work and you can do amazing things, but you're going to get burnt out so quickly. <clears throat> and that comes back to also like really um, leaning on like the people that you're working with and why it's so important. And you can't just like, tackle an issue by yourself. It's so important to have that community for it, for that reason. Um, not just like spreading out skills, but spreading out time and, and unpaid labor to like, <laughs> uh, attack this issue. But. Well, and I was going to say too, um, so an interesting thing, having not done my undergrad at the U um, is like, and I see this, I saw this both, and, and I actually, it's interesting too, now being at another institution, um, like, I think that there's this weird, like, hustle culture at the mm -hmm. U. Yeah. um where folks in Utah are like I need to do like be on the Forbes like 20 under 20 list or something like this like like there's so much like hustle girl boss culture of like I need to do all the things and excel and be in the leadership and it actually like honestly um being a general member of work is, is a good thing like yes. quitting things is a good thing <laughs> um I would actually say like part of balancing those things is actually figuring out what the priorities are like in 10 years are you gonna care that like you were the chair of the homecoming, whatever. Like, like if that is a thing that is not like truly like something that you're like in 10 years, I'm gonna be so happy that I did this thing or like that this is contributing to like the pathway of my life that I see for myself or the things that I really value. Um, like it sometimes like it's worth, like we've both quit stuff. Like oh, yeah. we have both like, <laughs> yeah, like, you know, like we've signed up for stuff and then we're like, you know what? Like I signed on for this thing and I actually, I don't have capacity to do this. I'm like, you don't owe anyone your time. You yeah. don't. Um, and so at the end of the day, like if you can be, if you know that you can quit something and be just as happy um, or happier because you have quit the thing, like just quit the thing, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, I think that's really part of the key balance. It's like, don't take on stuff just because you feel an obligation to it. And I will say, I think on racial and gender dynamics, like uh, like women of color, women in general, like end up taking on far more labor in activism spaces because we feel like we are responsible for like fixing all these things. Like it's not, right? Like these things are gonna unfortunately continue to persist, like whether we do or don't do those things. And so if you know that like your mental health, your physical health is declining because you're taking on too much, like, like rest is a liberatory practice, yeah. like rest quit things yeah and there is like guilt that definitely comes with doing that I think like regardless of how like um how thoroughly you believe in that in rest as a liberatory practice there's still like some amount of guilt because you're like oh but like I should have been the one to do all this work for whatever reason you, like, I think put I this said on like yourself. celebration emojis when you said that you would quit something I was <laughs> yes like... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true I think I, I think I quit like some some sort of job that I would like started and then I was like actually I'm quitting because I don't want to do this and everyone was like Whoa. yeah so like that's the other thing too is like build a community who like they're not there like you know like don't just put people in your community that are there to like help you like girl boss and hustle but like are also like care about you as a human being functional and like care about your well-being as a person and understand like when and why you need to step away from things at times yeah. so okay you've talked about like the impact of like your life and kind of balancing things. Um, so how do you navigate being a student of a university, but also taking a critical stance, like taking critical stances of said university? And how does this impact your school experience? Mm. <laughs> uh, I think uh, one of the things that we brought up earlier is like a good segue into answering this question, which is, or a good lead in into answering this question, which is um, like, it, on critical issues that are kind of maybe like hot button topics or you're putting some real pressure you're wanting to put real pressure on the university 
um, it's good to have that sort of system where you do have, you know, your like public facing folks um, and and then you have like your whole like, I don't want to say army, but your like your whole group behind you that's also um, doing that work um, and really sitting down and thinking like who would be good for that, not just in terms of like, oh, who's really like charismatic, but like who has like the least to to like put at risk basically um or maybe not the least but like who who's most most vulnerable to like blow like like uh to um like any sort of punches from the university back in that direction um but yeah what do you think yeah um <clears throat> no i'm glad that you had mentioned that the um, my joke answer that I learned I was going to give is like, you'll notice I'm not at the U anymore. Um, <laughs> but um, I, um, one of the things that I would say that I think is really important is like to think about activism and organizing. Um, let's think about like systems of repression as like a house, right? Um, it's this like ugly house that is there. You can't do anything with it. It's got to come down. You've got two approaches to this. You can take it out brick by brick from the outside you know, or like bulldoze it, right? Or you can like slowly take like bricks out from the inside. It's actually really important to have both. Like you need both. You need people who are gonna take the bricks out from the inside and like dismantle those things or change things around. And then you also need people who are eventually gonna do the bulldozing. And sometimes those things happen at the same time. Sometimes they happen in sequence or, um, you know, at different times. But um, I think that's actually really critical for this particular question. So um, for example, we've organized with folks that like, like have, pretty high access to power and like influence within the university um and they were able to help be like a brick by brick dismantler like where we'd like actually strategically say okay you know within the scope of like what you can do um without like tipping your hands that you're like working with unsafe you right like here's like okay the priorities of like what we think we might be able to give an access to power like maybe a policy that we can slightly change or a person that we think we can get on board to to do this thing um and it's why it's important also like for us to have multiple opportunities for this because um you know at the end of the day like there's a lot of people who want to be involved in our work but like literally like i am afraid to do <laughs> like i'm afraid to say those things because you know i am an employee here and i know that like xyz things will happen if i like say something about this or um and so i think um I mean, being realistic about the culture of like where you're working in your institution. So even within the U, you know, there are some offices that are like, yeah, like power to people, right? Like, um, and I've, we've had a lot of faculty allies actually who are like, yeah, like we're all about this. And like the, li like, honestly, like the libraries have been great. Like I love the libraries. <laughs> like it's awesome. Um, if, if whatever institution you're fighting has a library, like chances are like <laughs> they are going to be your people. <laughs> um, but, um, but then there's also some departments that like we know are very close to the power structures and want to keep the status quo. And so like we wash our hands of those things mm -hmm. um, and know that like it's not worth engaging them. Yeah. And when they try to engage us, we just say, thank you have a good day. <laughs> like, we don't want to talk to you. Um, and so, um, yeah, you do have to balance those things. And so I think thinking about that theory of power as well of like, mm. who makes sense to have the brick by brick from the inside and who, like, when are the opportunities that we need to bulldoze and who should do those and who is going to be least vulnerable to the impacts of like getting some debris on them. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. So, that's a good analogy. um, and then it looks like there's some questions in the chat. Yes, um, there are, feel free to grab whichever one you want to take on. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to read them both out loud. Um, so how do we find correct information on social media when looking into policies? And how do we encourage our peers to join in on working towards social change? Awesome. Um, we'll do the first one first. Yeah, let's do okay. the first one. That's a good question. Um, so the correct information on social media. Um, whew, this is a hard one. <laughs> um, okay, so um, we've gotten a lot of recent practice with this because TikTok has taken off as such an organizing tool, um, like because algorithmically you reach like, because the videos are so short, you can reach lots of people and the For You page, like the algorithm's so good and tuned to stuff that like, if you've ever engaged in activism stuff, you're probably gonna get other activism stuff that pops up. Yeah. Um, but um, you also have to be really careful on those, right? So. Um, for example, there's been a couple of um, like probably four or five universities this term because this like sexual assault campus safety issues have really taken off this term. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the information folks are trying to be helpful. So like they'll have heard something um, and by the time they like publish it on social media, it's not accurate. One of the first things that we do is like we actually just go and look for news articles. Mm -hmm. um, a thing that we didn't put in here, but like 
generally like oh um <laughs> uh sorry um so generally one of um like local journalists are honestly like one like especially print journalists um not so much the tv journalists but i'd say print and radio journalists the pieces usually have like really excellent information they have very high public like integrity standards on this um because they have again like they're they're kind of playing by the same rules of like your words your reputation mm -hmm. Um, and they tend to like have more context or like links to primary documents of stuff, right? So, um, for example, when we were researching this like Fiji history stuff, um, we started with like local newspaper, so like the school newspaper, local newspaper um, in what is it, Lincoln, Nebraska, um, that like had done coverage of like the prior sexual assault that had happened there. Um, so we like put together our timeline based off of the primary and secondary sources we saw, and then saw like. Okay, this up, like what's happening on the social media piece of this and we asked questions because there were a couple places where we're like okay there's like this whole timeline here we don't understand what's happening you all talked about this do you know like where that information's from um and so asking accounts about information like private messaging them um i recommend like uh i, I will say like um we have multiple people that manage like all of our social media stuff and we do get like weird messages sometimes that are like like how do you know this thing right like and it's like don't ask it like that but just be like hey i was like looking at this article um and i like i saw this link but like didn't see this piece of information would love to read the like source about that that's a great way to ask that question um i will also say too like people like weird i think people think that we're like some like paid organization or something yeah. and like <laughs> um yeah um <laughs> Um, in terms of the like encouraging peers to join in for social change, um, mm -hmm. Rebecca has been, I think, like, like she's been like the whiz at like how do we get like especially like new folks that like maybe don't think that this is like a space that would they would normally want to be in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah. like I I really like truly do believe in that like strategy of like finding the thing that that person is like passionate about and like able to like engage in within the cause like at like whatever level works for them um and using that as sort of the stepping stone because i think some people um want to like join in on our work but and and they really have like so much to offer and they have like great knowledge and skills but they're like very nervous about sort of being in the space where you are sort of in like opposition towards a large institution mm -hmm. um, that you benefit from in, in maybe multiple ways. Um, and um, just being like, being able to be extremely supportive, like, and, and there for them, like, and encouraging them like all the time um, that like, and, and kind of like being able to not hold their hand, but like, I don't know, just like walk with them through the fire and like, and that's happening in, in their brains. Um, I think also um, being able to have that intersectional like work, like we talked about earlier is really incredibly helpful when you are trying to like engage more students and like more of your peers on an issue um, because they're, they're seeing that like intersectionality of issues that like maybe they care a lot about, um, about um, police abolition or something like that. And being able to see like how your groups work, how our groups work, like ties into that has helped, I think, bring a lot of people like into like the threshold of like supporting unsafe you and like being aware of the work that we do. Um, and also prioritizing that work as well and seeing, oh, okay, like, like not that I didn't care about like sexual assault um, survivors and like helping them before, but like now this issue is like way more forefront on my mind. Um, yeah. And yeah. We have another question from Chilali that says, how do you approach individuals with opposing views without making them feel like they're not being heard? I do want to add one other thing to the social change. Um, oh, yeah. No, it's fine. It's um, So the other thing I would say, too, is I think where people start feeling burnt out on joining social change causes is sometimes it feels like it's a vacuum or a void. One of the things that we've been trying to do with our account is like share where we've had successes and stuff, right? Mm. So, for example, um, we were actually looking at this this summer and we didn't end up doing like a post or anything about it, but we realized um, by like continuing to put pressure on and as we've been like talking with people, like like 80, 85% of them actually have gone into effect in some way, shape or form. And yeah. like a lot of the things from the get go, the university was like, I don't know that we can do this. And like, they went into effect. <laughs> um, some of them, they were like, oh no, this is impossible. Yeah, like the <laughs> independent review board. And then like, and granted like the independent review board, like we have our bones to pick about it, but mm. it's, it's still better than it was before right like we actually have 
we have shifted things. Um, and sharing those wins is really important because like the whole purpose that we even started this was because so many people felt powerless in the midst of the Lauren McCluskey lawsuit and they felt like they had no power or control of what was happening. And the fact that like um, through basically like Instagram like <laughs> organizing, we were able to like influence policy on so many levels and so many things. Mm -hmm. Um, like it's dramatically shifted a lot of stuff. So even if it, like campus safety is not like the top conversation or whatever, there's like institutional pieces that have now gone into place and we're continuing to build on those, but like those are still wins, right? Like we got a win on the vaccine mandate. Like we like celebrating those wins, I think are really important because then people feel like it's not just like energy that's going into a black hole, but like actually going somewhere. Yeah. Oh, that's a, made me think yeah. of, um, oh, what did you say that made me think of something? Um, oh, I was sorry. I had to remind myself what I thought because what you just said, I was like, oh, that's a really good point. Um, so I think one thing too, especially if you're working in like in like social change, but like you are starting to like get into, I think like the nitty gritty of like policy change. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes uh, the policy change that you're seeking, which could be like incredibly important and actually like like one of the most like pivotal changes boring. that you could make. It's, it's so, so boring. boring. It's so boring. <laughs> It's not like <laughs> fun to post about like upfront. SB one sixty three was like inherently a non sexy bill. Like it's no, so it was, boring. It was. It was like <laughs> it was like so incredibly important, but it was like really hard. We you have to find that angle that like makes people excited to like support it. And also, I think recognizing at times like you're gonna have so much momentum behind an issue because of the like um, maybe the instant impact that it's having on students, or like it's just. Um, like something that a lot of people are paying attention to for whatever reason, um, uh, that you'll have a lot of move momentum there and being able to like use that momentum and like push people into caring about something that doesn't feel as like uh, exciting uh, to advocate for, like a se state Senate bill. Um, it's important to just like continue like pushing people in that direction and, and having like maybe interlude posts, you know, from time to time about like, other things that engage people along the way there's well, also oh go ahead <laughs> oh I was just gonna say I was like there is one more question there and I think we could actually combine the question about opposing views yeah. along with people who agree but disagree about the methods um because you, we encounter a lot of those we I would say like the campus police abolition is actually like where a lot of these things came to a head yeah and especially the approach that we ended up taking to this is we're going to explain the rationale for why we are taking the actions that we are. We're not gonna like tear down other people's approaches to this um, because ultimately we do believe that like everyone has to feel safe on campus for the campus to be actually safe, right? So <clears throat> let's say we get rid of campus police. Um, Utah is, you know, it has like the highest like concealed carry rate in the country. Um, that does not make lots of people feel like particularly comfortable, right? Like, especially people who um, are most vulnerable to the forms of gun violence that exists in the US. We don't want people that being like, you know, roguely taking the law into their own hands, right? Because they suddenly feel like it's like this lawless campus. So like, we actually do have to engage people who maybe still want the police there and heavy police presence, but helping them understand like, Hey, <clears throat> so we hear your concerns on this and here's like the infrastructure that we want to build to ensure that these things are less of an issue and like um, trying to also find common ground of like, that's like, okay, we're moving the needle forward. Like we can agree on this common ground piece of this and the next phase is, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, and the piece about like people who agree with you but disagree about how you want to go about it. Um, that's one of the reasons too why we're like this, that analogy of like the house, right? Like we need people taking all sorts of approaches, right? So um, a really good example is like, there's also um, Safe U of U as a student organization. Like they did, they're a formally recognized group. They work very closely with administration. They have a ton of presidential interns. They're like, they have like leadership stuff. Like we are fully supportive of all the stuff that they're doing because like we, we really do need it at all levels. Like we get to be like, like I hate the cop analogy, but like we get to be bad cop and they're like <laughs> able to be like good cop on this. But um, like, and it, and it helps because like it does move policy forward and have has multiple lenses of accountability. Um, so, I mean, you know, as long as people are not like actively hurting others in this, like we'll say like, oh yeah, like this isn't our jam for this event. We're like, eh, don't feel super comfortable on this. Mm -hmm. um, but like, we still get 
you know, messages that are like, hey, we want to collaborate on this thing, like when there are places where like there's clear interaction. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I think also just um, in terms of like approaching, especially like individuals who have opposing views and they like make them known to us, especially like on social media, <laughs> we are pretty good at like responding directly to them. Um, sometimes that's not always like nice. Yeah. Um, like it's like being blunt and like giving them the facts again and like being like, okay, like this is what you said and here's our response. But sometimes that's like, depending on like the situation that might be like sitting down with this person and like having a conversation with them, like one-on-one face-to-face, like maybe I'm getting coffee with somebody and I'm like, okay, let's talk about this. And then there's like maybe some misunderstanding or we just realize like, you know what, we don't agree on this issue yeah. or some um, people also like yeah. will just troll. Like they're not yeah. like, that's the other thing too, I would say is like, <laughs> save your energy for people who are actually trying to authentically engage. Like if they're just there to like, like if you know that they're not engaging in good faith and they're, they're there to like be difficult, you do not owe anyone your time. Uh, and you'll see like, if you look on our account, there's times where we've been like, thank you for your input. Like that's not the stance we take, but like, you know, glad you have mentioned that. We do delete like racist, homophobic, sexist stuff. Like we have a zero tolerance policy for that. That's not like a matter of difference of opinions. That's oppression. And we don't, we don't do that on our page. (laughs) Um, so like also drawing lines in the sand on those things is very helpful. Like, you know, you don't need to like sit there and take racism from people. Like that's not a difference of opinion. Right. Um, but you know, if, and if they're not engaging in good faith, that's also, you know, there's no point in engaging with that. But if it's literally like, okay, I have a different thought on this and I want to discuss this, that's maybe worth your time. And there's a lot of ways you can go about that, whether that's in person or, you know. Yeah, whatever so. way. Yeah. Thank you so much to both of you for sharing your insight and taking the time to prepare for this um, breakout session. I definitely learned a lot and I hope everyone that participating also learned a lot. Um, I just want to quickly remind all of the participants about Um, the survey that we will be sending out after the conference just to make sure that we can make the conference for next year even better. So thank you again and have a good rest of your day, everyone.